Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, uh, good afternoon and a very warm welcome to you, all, to you all and particularly, of course, our panelists this afternoon. Um, the event um, this afternoon, we have called it Committed to Collective Action, Multilateral Engagement for Peace and Security by Small and Medium States. It is co-hosted by the International Peace Institute, the uh, Danish Institute for International Studies, uh, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Denmark. These days, wherever international decision makers gather, and particularly here in New York, the crisis of multilateralism is an inescapable topic about shifts in the uh, global and regional balance of power, flouting of international norms and agreements from international humanitarian law to nuclear non-proliferation, rising nationalism, growing protectionism, increasing intolerance, and preference for bellicosity over diplomacy. All of this has fueled um, a sense, and it goes broad and deep, that the existing rule-based order is ending, and indeed that there is much cause, and indeed there is much cause for concern about the current state of the multilateral system. Yet most member states remain deeply committed to international cooperation. Recently, there have been many examples of diverse group of states working together to solve collective security challenges. One example is the establishment of the Alliance for Multilateralism, which is meeting at the UN at the ministerial level tomorrow. The aim of today's discussion is to focus on examples where multilateralism actually is working. We want to look at what lessons these examples offer to reinforce effective cooperation on international peace and security. In particular, today's discussion will focus on how small and medium states can come together and work even more closely to advance common security goals. These states are most at risk in an order where rules can be broken with impunity. In a nutshell, one could say that less structure weakens the small and strengthens the big. Just a few years ago, IPI held a meeting in uh, Salzburg, Austria, on whether the international system was falling apart or pulling together. A recurring theme was um, that addressing the most pressing multilateral challenges, such topics as climate change, migration, violent extremism, this depends on finding shared interests among diverse countries. Solutions to challenges that define national borders cannot rely only on like-minded countries on these and many other topics. Member states will remain at the core of the multilateral, of the multilateral system, but the system has to be inclusive of also other voices. These are themes that I hope our speakers today will reflect on. Kevin Rudd, the chair of IPS board, will moderate today's discussion. Kevin was, as you, most of you know, was also the chair of IPI's Independent Commission on Multilateralism. But before I give the floor to um, Kevin, and um, before he takes the helm, it is now my pleasure to give the floor to Louise Rees Andersen, uh, who is representing the Danish Institute for International Studies. So Louise, the floor is yours. Thank you, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished members of the audience. On behalf of the Danish Institute for International Studies, I would also like to welcome you and to thank you for taking time off your very busy schedules to join us today. As Terje said, we're meeting at a time when multilateralism, its crisis and how to defend and develop it, is rapidly climbing the global ladder of political attention. 
From Beijing to Berlin, from Delhi to Davos, decision makers and agenda setters are now declaring their support for multilateralism and for the rules-based and cooperative international order that it underpins. This is indeed a positive development for those of us who believe that multilateralism, much like democracy, is the worst form of governance, except for all the others. Much like democracy, however, multilateralism comes in many shapes and forms. And agreeing on a precise definition has always been difficult, both in theory and in practice. In the present era, the need for rethinking existing approaches and finding new and more inclusive mechanisms for working together is becoming very clear. The old ways, however we define them, are bogged down and by overlapping crises of trust, efficiency and legitimacy. Yet we also need to remind ourselves that there are many areas within the existing system where we continue to see effective cooperation. And that it's also, we need also to remind ourselves that it is much easier to channel our attention into ensuring the effectiveness of existing institutions than it is to build new ones. To overcome the perception that global cooperation is dysfunctional, we need to focus not just on the shortcomings of the existing system, which we, and this includes researchers such as myself, are so very good at identifying. We also need to focus on those areas where the system does work and is delivering results to states and peoples around the globe. And this includes pointing out how new actors and alliances are stepping up, even as some of the older mechanisms are paralyzed by disruptive and destructive power plays. So it was with this forward-looking and maybe willed optimism that we set out to organize today's event. And we asked our distinguished panelists to reflect on how they, as small states, middle powers, can work together even more closely to advance effective collective action in today's fraying yet totally interdependent world. I look forward to your discussions. And without further ado, I will pass the floor to the moderator of today's debate, the Honorable Kevin Rudd, 26th Prime Minister of Australia, President of the Asia Society Policy Institute, and Chairman of the IPI Board of Directors. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Louise. And if I could begin just by commending the uh, Kingdom of Denmark for um, its uh, support for this initiative and the work that you've done in your institute. Um, yeah, I'm chairman of the board here and uh, welcome to the International Peace Institute. We're 50 years old, uh, almost, and uh, our mission statement is to help support the UN system into the future in every practical and conceptual way possible. That's what we're here for. But we're also a hospitable mob. Um, there's a lot of people standing up the back. I can count about six chairs down here. Those of you who got sore feet, you can come down here. If you want to take photographs of your employers from the back there, I understand that. That's politics. Um, but there are other chairs around if you'd like to take a seat. Obviously, they're all staffers. The subject uh, we've been set uh, is a critical one for the future of the system. Um, and it goes to the uh, future uh, relevance of the multilateral system uh, to medium and small states, uh, and also, creatively, uh, what medium and small states can do to enhance the multilateral system into the future. Uh, when I was Prime Minister of Australia, I used to co I coined this phrase, I believe in something called creative middle power diplomacy. Uh, there was also a concept around about the role and agency of creative powers. And what was the unifying idea? The unifying idea was that some of us in the international system, uh, particularly small and medium states, have a particular responsibility to continue to defend, strengthen, and augment the multilateral system as a public good in itself. Not just for what the multilateral system might do for us on issue X, Y, and Z, A, B, and C, but as a public policy goal in itself. And the reason for that is, ultimately, great powers have about them a particular self-delusion. Uh, they think they can look after themselves, uh, and they don't need a system. Uh, guess what? The rest of us have concluded a long time ago, we do need a system. And those of you who might doubt that, have a long, hard look at the Second World War. Uh, that indicates what happens when you have no system. 
So this whole idea of how we therefore harness the energies, the creativity, uh, and the combined resources of small to medium powers against this core policy object of enhancing the continued effectiveness and legitimacy of the multilateral system anchored in the UN Charter and anchored in the United Nations is fundamental work for us all. Uh, we have an excellent panel uh, to discuss this. We're going to begin with some presentations from individual panel members. Um, and given that our Danish friends have had so much to do uh, with the production of um, uh, this work, we'll start with uh, Jep Kofod, the Minister of Foreign Affairs for Denmark. And then I'll introduce the other ministers as we run through. Yep, over to you. <clears throat> Well, thank you so much, uh, Kevin, and, and thank you so much for organizing this very important event. Um, you know, I think uh, as a small and medium-sized state, I think it's important that we uh, put this on top of our agenda, how we can ensure uh, effective uh, multilateralism, effective rule-based order that really reflects the aspirations and needs of the people in the world. Um, and uh, therefore, I always say, you know, when you look at the UN Charter and looking at the first words, we the peoples, we have to remember that. So even though there are great powers, strong powers, smaller powers, I think we all people of the same world and we have a special responsibility as smaller and medium sized states to uphold that value and that norm in our international system. So I'm a, a recent, uh, I was I'm a new minister only appointed less than three uh, months ago, but I, I'm uh, always in my life supported uh, active multilateralism uh, very uh, as a very important uh, mean to to an end because I think that's what it is. We have to remember that um, some of the fatigue that are now as uh, over multilateralism and rule-based order that is coming under pressure is also due to the feeling of many people that it doesn't deliver on their concerns, whether it's um, uh, the, the threat, security threats from terrorist groups or it's a uh, uncontrolled migration or it's a climate action or the climate issue uh, there people expect multilateral systems to deliver and I think a key thing for me is that small and medium-sized states has to show that action is needed not only that's why I was very happy um, Monday when we had the climate action summit that we saw that the Secretary General really put focus on actions not words because I think that's what people need because that's a way to gain broader support for a uh, rule-based world order and also multilateralism again is if we see that this uh, produces real difference. I'm coming from, I was thinking while, before I, I went to this panel, uh, Kevin, I was thinking, okay, what to say? I'm coming from a political party in Denmark where we, um, you know, it was under my uh, party that we joined, uh, we formed NATO, the North Atlantic uh, Treaty Organization. That was when, when then my, my party was in power. It was also... Uh, when we uh, joined the European Union in, uh, in, 90, in 1973, it was under my prime minister's well call for a referendum in, in 72, um, and we joined 73. So, and it was under my government also in, in uh, 93 uh, when we uh, laid the foundation for the enlargement of European Union with the Copenhagen criteria, rule of law, human rights, world functioning, market economy, as a precondition for expanding in that time, Europe, whole and free, and in peace after the end of the of the Cold War. And I'm just looking at the world today, and I'm saying, okay, what is really some of the challenges we, we see now? We have the climate action, we have the uh, Paris Accord. That was a testimony to me to collective efforts of the world that we, in 2015, managed to have this agreement. And one could doubt that this could happen today under these circumstances that we are in, unfortunately. Um, we have the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, that is a fantastic framework for a more holistic approach to, uh, to how we develop our societies, not only economic, uh, not only environmental and, and climate, but also economic and social development goes hand in hand. So what should we do um, as small and medium-sized state in the world we are in today? Great, uh, there's more great power uh, competition, there are um, uh, eroding support for multilateral uh, and rule-based order. I think we should try to lead by example again. Um, and uh, Denmark is trying. We just adopted this government uh, on climate, for example, uh, when we came into office three months ago. We said, OK, let's do a target for emissions reductions, which is 70% in 2030, much higher than anybody would dare to do only uh, two years ago. 
and to show the way that we need to, to, to make this green trans transformation. So, so I think we should think, one, leading by example, but also, secondly, trying to pull our efforts together. I mean, um, uh, joining alliances uh, around how to uphold multilateralism. Um, of course, European Union there is a key player, in my opinion, um, to, to do that. But also widely, I think we, what we need to do is also to uh, bridge the uh, traditional uh, divisions in the world between, uh, let's like, say, European countries and, and countries in Africa or Asia or, or um, Latin America. I mean, we need to have alliances across uh, the small and medium-sized states as well. So Australia is a very important uh, a part in that. Um, so therefore, um, what I want to say uh, in the beginning is that, well, I, I believe we, on one hand, has, you know, because we are in a crisis, so to speak, it, one hand, we are putting our efforts much harder together, some of our smaller and medium-sized states, to uphold multilateralism, to, to deliver on people what people want. On the other hand, you see uh, the great power, some of them are um, challenging uh, the system. And I like what you were saying, Kevin, in the beginning, because it's true, uh, there's no... Uh, power in the world alone that can decide anything without uh, others. So, so we need this uh, strong framework around cooperation. The, the very important themes, for example, um, rule of law, human rights, democracy, uh, and a, a livable civil society, uh, many of these are under, under pressure. Um, and therefore, uh, I think again, we are now uh, three smaller states sitting in the panel. I think we have a from, from different parts of the world, we, we, as, we, we have a, a special responsibility to, to deliver. So in my initial remarks, and I look forward to discussion afterwards, I, I would say, uh, yes, Denmark, we, um, we yeah. want to see that, uh, that multilateralism is effectively reformed. And, um, and being now uh, at the UN um, General Assembly, um, seeing on one hand how important the, the dialogue is between uh, the 193 states of the UN uh, in the plenary, even though we fiercely disagree on something. I mean, I was listening yesterday to the three first speeches when the opening of the General Assembly. Uh, the, the first one was really good, I think. Uh, um, I mean, the Secretary General, uh, Guterres. And, and then there was two other speeches that, that uh, also was very interesting. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and I think that, that you know, it, it shows in a way that the challenges and diversities in the world. I think you can be a, I think you can be a patriot, and I think you can be a, a multilateralist at the same time. I don't see, and, and small states should actually show that it's, it's, it's possible. You can love your country, you can love your way of life, and at the same time you can love international cooperation. That doesn't need to be uh, something uh, that between these, these two positions. So that's what we, that's what Denmark is going into. That's what we want. So. With these remarks, we'll just look forward to the discussion, Kevin, and um, thank you again for organizing this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Yep, and thank you for reminding us of the difference between a good speech and an interesting speech. Uh, the, but we won't dwell on that any longer. It would be impolitic with an institution such as ours to do so. Uh, but also, importantly, your comments before uh, about uh, patriotism and uh, these institutions, uh, such as the United Nations. Uh, my simple catchphrase is, multilateralism is in the national interest. Uh, those who argue that nationalism and multilateralism represent polar opposites, <coughs> frankly, that's a, an intellectual delusion. Uh, it doesn't work as a matter of logic. Uh, it might work as a piece of political rhetoric, but it doesn't work as a piece of actual logic. Um, we're also, if we're moving north of Denmark, and there's not, further mu not much further to move north from, you head across the Baltic and you arrive at the beautiful land of Estonia. Uh, Minister Urmas uh, Rensselu, Minister for Foreign Affairs, cybersecurity, a huge um, priority for the Estonian government. They've become uh, global product champions of cybersecurity. I understand it's a now a separate department uh, within um, your own ministry. Uh, Minister, we look forward to your contribution to the discussion. And I should also say, uh, Estonia has co-authored with us, the International Peace Institute, uh, the following publication, A Necessary, a Necessary Voice, uh, Small States, International Law and the UN Security Council. So thank you, Estonia, for working with us on that. Yes, thank you, Kevin. 
I and Jeppe are coming from the European Union, uh, very unique multilateral uh, framework of uh, independent countries. And, um, well, we can't even go to pub to have a beer without multilateral decisions amongst <laughs> member states. And we are basically fine with that. Yes. We, we are uh, able to achieve uh, to results, and what is very important, with the core results, with the core outcome of policy making, uh, small countries and uh, bigger countries uh, by size uh, have the same rights. It's the most important concept of the uh, European Union, I would say. Okay, UK would like to have their own peers now. <laughs> but let's see what happens. So speaking about, the, as uh, Sir Kevin made a very, very important uh, remark about patriotism and uh, multilateralism. And that means, I, I totally agree with that concept, that particularly for small countries and medium-sized countries, so as a UN definition, I understand this, 10 million inhabitants, for small and medium-sized countries, um, uh, basically, if they do not appear to have nuclear rockets, the international law system is their main guarantee of independence and national interests. So our nuclear bomb, H-bomb, is international law, as multilateral order. And um, by saying that, uh, let me say that uh, by speaking about the multilateral uh, order, I think it could be uh, like formed uh, as, or summed in a, in a phrase that uh, don't do that you don't uh, want uh, others to to you. So basically, this is actually, I would call it as a as a main uh, idea of multilateralism. And, um, well, if, if we're speaking about the uh, crisis of multilateralism, surely there are issues uh, linked to the identity, linked to the economic interests, uh, um, unrest of the uh, electorates, etc. But I think uh, it uh, is a question always into which perspective we will put things. Uh, in a dime scale, uh, well, uh, where were these uh, Garden of Eden times when the world had a fully uh, implemented multilateral order? I remember when Helsinki Accord was signed, uh, Brezhnev and uh, Ford came to Helsinki and others. So, uh, very lovely piece of paper, multilateral piece of paper was signed, but Estonia still remained occupied by Soviet Union. <laughs> so uh, th that is a multilateral order I won't accept. Uh, but uh, so I think uh, surely after the uh, collapse of uh, Cold War uh, era, uh, we looked that there is a, a linear progress in international uh, or uh, order. And if we look actually from the last generation these United Nations uh, 2030 goals. So by the, uh, looking to the, uh, just the figures, so the main uh, vast uh, uh, catalog of goals were, is actually, uh, it, it looks very, quite promising by figures. So it, it means that uh, international community in many areas of practical interest uh, is, uh, is still able of the uh, uh, instinct of rationality to cooperate. And um, let me also make a remark um, uh, about uh, the future um, uh, of the, or the challenges, how the uh, small and medium-sized countries who uh, should also in the United Nations fora to address uh, uh, the importance of multilateralism. I think uh, the one issue is very important uh, is uh, security council reform issues. So uh, the, there is a, actually, I would say that the old system, current system of Security Council decision making, especially speaking about the, uh, in the, in the genocidal crimes and, uh, and tackling these, uh, this, uh, to my understanding, turns to be quite out fashioned. The second issue is very important, is actually because there is no uh, fully implemented uh, a 
statute of Security Council, it is very important to elaborate with the working methods of Security Council. So this is actually a uh, ability to uh, quickly act uh, on the objective, uh, fair mediator uh, philosophy basis, this is actually one of the, again, guarant guaranteeing elements of the uh, small countries, uh, small and medium-sized countries. And the third pillar element I would call, uh, where also I would believe is a rational interest uh, of uh, countries, is indeed a um, tackling a new modern threats to international security and uh, peace. Uh, Boris Johnson yesterday, I read, spoke about Terminator coming from future and starting to kill us. <laughs> so uh, uh, I think uh, the Terminators need to be indeed uh, resisted and the United Nations Security Council would be proper place to do that. So uh, uh, that is an issue. Estonia is becoming a Security Council member from the beginning of next year. So that is the issue of uh, uh, how we will uh, face uh, an, uh, a modern threats also in the international law order and how we will going to make a seeds to the uh, ground uh, to, to establish a new uh, international customary law, what doesn't today uh, not exist. This is a, we as Estonia see uh, our mission a lot uh, during our period uh, in two years' time in Security Council. So uh, multilateralism, uh, this is a question of values uh, and question of practical cooperation, but particularly for these countries who appear to have no nuclear weapons, it is a question of uh, 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 to be or not to be. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ermas. Uh, what a really uh, great observation and very stark language, which is um, for those of us uh, who choose not to have nuclear weapons, uh, our core national security is in fact guaranteed by international law, to say exactly what you said, international law uh, constitute our nukes. It's a very pithy expression. Mind you, I disagreed with your earlier statement, you can't have a beer in a bar without a multilateral meeting. That would never happen in Australia. We'd just go for the beer anyway. <laughs> so that's the difference between Europeans and Australians. Now, uh, uh, I'm Al Safadi, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Jordan. Uh, Jordan's been a leading voice for youth empowerment to prevent and resolve conflict. And during uh, Jordan's presidency of the Security Council, uh, it held, in fact, uh, the first debate uh, of the Security Council on Youth peace and, peace and Security, examining the role of youth in countering violent extremism and promoting peace. We look forward very much to hearing from you today. Ayman. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Prime Minister. Uh, dear colleagues, friends. I think I'm going to have a bit of a different perspective here. Europe and uh, Omar come from you know, a region that is plagued with conflict and crisis and war and lack of institutional mechanisms. I come from the Middle East where there's peace, there's security, there's progress, there's no conflict. So, uh, uh, so it's a, a bit of a different take here. Uh, Ultimately, reality is multilateralism is under threat. Uh, from the receiver side, public opinion has lost confidence in it because it simply either has failed to deliver or uh, there was a greater deal of selectiveness in applying its decisions. And of course, the world in which we find ourselves now, there's a lot of questioning about uh, commitment to that system. But uh, Ultimately, if you're a small or medium-sized country uh, that are uh, having to deal with the consequences of unilateral actions, uh, uh, then you do appreciate the value of multilateralism and the need for all of us to work uh, uh, together. Uh, if you're a patriot, you've got to be a multilateralist because patriotism is all about doing what's right and good for your country, and multilateralism is a certain path to uh, increasing our ability to address challenges and, and seize opportunities that are, that are there. Um, what do we do? We've got to uh, bring back uh, the realization of the value to the multilateral uh, uh, system. There is a strength in numbers, but there is also a strength in vision, and there is even more strength in our ability to translate that vision in, in, into action uh, in a way that allows us to, to deal with those challenges. Um, uh, occupation is an ugly unilateral act. 
but its implications, its repercussions are for all of us. So it affects all of us, and therefore uh, it needs uh, an effective multilateral work to reverse it and reverse the ills and, uh, and the evils that it produces. Uh, Palestinian-Israeli conflict, the Israeli occupation, uh, continues to persist. Uh, all efforts at resolving it have failed because simply we were not able to bring the uh, uh, values of multilateral system, international law, international decisions, resolutions to bear in terms of implementing them on the ground. Uh, so uh, you look at the Middle East and they say multilateralism is not working. Uh, we have to... Uh, uh, address that as a reality and uh, say that uh, international law is there to be respected. Uh, our collective heritage in terms of uh, forging out uh, regulations and rules have to be uh, applied. Uh, refugees, another major challenge that is probably born of within the unilateral context of a country. But once refugees are out, it becomes a multilateral challenge. Unfortunately, uh, the most difficult negative consequences are borne by, by neighboring countries. Uh, but in reality, unless we all work together, we cannot uh, address that challenge. I, again, I come from a country where uh, we're the largest per capita host of refugees. Uh, 1.3 million Syrians, again, we've been at the receiving end of every crisis in the region that was initiated by the unilateral acts and the multilateral system has failed to, uh, to address. Um, Talk about refugees, um, uh, it is a real challenge now. Uh, host countries can do what they can, but unless we all uh, uh, come together, uh, there is no way we can tackle that challenge. And then the negative implications of that challenge are going to multiply, because if you uh, abandon young people, people to, to hate, to bitterness, to ignorance, uh, they're going to be exploited by every radical out there. But if we uh, do everything we can to give them a shot at a decent life and education, then uh, we're investing in our collective security and future. If, if you do not uh, tackle this problem in the Middle East, in the immediate neighborhood of that conflict, they're going to be uh, looking uh, for elsewhere to look at. And we've seen how uh, Europe dealt with uh, the uh, uh, refugees challenge, a fragment of what a small country like Jordan had to deal with. But again, uh, it showed how... Uh, uh, unless we all come together, we'll not be able to solve that challenge. And now uh, we need multilateralism to operate at its best because um, there is uh, uh, donor fatigue, uh, but realistically speaking, there is host country fatigue as well. Uh, again, just to give a real life example, in Jordan, uh, at a time when suffering um, unemployment of about 19% on average, 40% among youth, 45% among women, growth is under 2%, we've given 150,000 work permits to Syrians. That is four times the number of jobs our economy can create on an annual basis. 300,000 more work in the informal economy, and we let them because if they don't work, how are they going to feed their kids? Uh, 155,000 kids in our public schooling system, and you can imagine the pressure that that puts on all of that. So to say deal with it on your own is an abandonment of our uh, multilateral uh, uh, system. Uh, terrorism. Again, uh, that is probably one of the most obvious global challenges uh, that we all face. Uh, terrorism could be born out of a certain uh, context, but the impact, uh, the disastrous consequences are, uh, are on all of us. Uh, no one country can tackle that threat alone because for the terrorists, there are no borders. There are no uh, one entity. Everything is a legitimate target. Everybody who opposes them, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, in the Middle East, outside the Middle East, is a legitimate target. So it is a global challenge. And unless we have a holistic approach uh, to dealing with it, we will not be able to deal with it. And that's why we, His Majesty, initiated the Aqaba process, which is pretty much plays into the heart of what we're saying now, create a multilateral mechanism that will pool our resources together to thus become more effective in tackling a threat that is global in its dimensions and, and terrible consequences. And we can only tackle it if we work together, because if you get the terrorists in Syria and Iraq, you don't get them in Libya, they're going to go to Libya. Get them in Libya, don't get them in the Sahel or in Somal, they're going to go to Somal. So that is part of the aspect that we, we need uh, uh, to deal with as well. Um, ultimately, the fact that multilateralism is under challenge does not mean we abandon it. Actually, it means that we have to stick to it more. We have to show value more. And I think small, medium-sized countries, again, uh, that realize the need for multilateralism can always come together and come up with a narrative 
And it's a very convincing narrative. It doesn't take, you know, the, you cannot argue against the need for all of us to work together. So I think the pressure is on us to keep uh, the narrative alive, uh, to make sure that we keep sending the message that uh, uh, isolation is no option. Uh, working alone is not going to get us to deal with the challenges. Ours, it used to be, it's becoming a cliche, but it is a reality, it is an interdependent world. Uh, we have to work together. Uh, unfortunately, again, there's a lot of challenges to that, even within uh, regions that have gone a long way in institutionalizing regional, um, effective regional cooperation mechanisms that is being challenged. A region then, like the Middle East, in all fairness and honesty, we do not have effective regional uh, cooperation mechanism, and that's impacting everything from the job market to environment to trade to education to all of that. So I can only add my voice to those of my colleagues in agreeing that we need to keep the narrative alive, uh, no matter how big the challenge is. Uh, uh, our being here together is an act of multilateralism that, that, that we need to enforce and support, and, and thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Minister, for those reflections. I think those of us who um, see ourselves as global citizens uh, long observed now the disproportionate uh, burden of a failure of the multilateral system visited on a small country the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, in terms of the outflow from Syria caused by events for which Jordan was not faintly responsible. Um, and it, for me, poses a critical question, which is when we look at the evolution of the refugees crisis, uh, as it affected Jordan, and it affected Lebanon, as it affected Turkey, and then, frankly, wider Europe, um, what was the actual failure of our system which enabled us as a system to somehow assume that if the Jordanians and the, and the Lebanese and the Turks had some capacity to control four and a half million refugees between them, that it wasn't the rest of our problem. Because when we, um, around about, from, correct me if I'm wrong, Minister, 2015-16, um, maybe a little earlier, decided we couldn't fund the UNHCR sufficiently to maintain the daily living allowance uh, for uh, refugees uh, in your country and uh, in Lebanon and elsewhere, then that's when they all moved, or some of them moved. And we've seen the wider consequences in terms of the politics of Europe. So what is it about our system that we do not have an automatic, what I describe as default mechanism, which clicks in? Um, whereby we assume this is wrong. Jordan should not have to sustain this burden. And therefore, it's a global problem because it's uh, come, a, come about as a series of other factors beyond our control. So I'd be interested in any reflections on that as it affects the wider uh, multilateral management of the growing crisis of asylum seekers, refugees, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and migration. Um, so I'm not sure which of you would like to... Uh, uh, open up on that, and perhaps given it's your country most affected, your thoughts on that would be appreciated. Uh, again, um, there is donor fatigue uh, when it comes to the Syrian refugees issues. Uh, people are looking elsewhere. Uh, there's a lot of pledges. Uh, the last, uh, for instance, this year, we only got 15% of, uh, of, of the response plan that we put out to tackle refugees. And look, realistically, refugees would like to stay in the region. Um, because their home is near nearby, and therefore the hope of going back will will always be bigger if they're if they're nearby. And the realistic possibilities of them going back will even be stronger because if you're a Syrian refugee and you're in Jordan, it's the same language, pretty much the same culture. But if you're six year old and you come to Jordan and now you're twelve, you still relate. But if you're in Germany or in Denmark or anywhere else. By the time you're 18, that's a distant memory. Uh, you know, you don't speak the language, you don't relate to the culture, so they're not going to go back. Um, number two, the cost of sustaining refugees in the region is really probably one twentieth percent of the cost of sustaining a refugee in Europe. Uh, so that is something we need to keep in mind, uh, the long-term consequences and also the cost of doing that. And um, 
Yes, there is fatigue. I mean, uh, World Food Program also stopped giving subsidies. Uh, uh, again, uh, countries like us, yesterday we had a meeting of uh, neighboring countries of Syria, Turkey, Iraq, uh, Lebanon, and Jordan, and the discussion was about the return of refugees. As Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, we're committed to voluntarily return. We're just not going to go about it any other way. We will never push any refugee to go back, no matter how hard the, the, the challenge is, because by the end of the day, these are victims, and you don't want to victimize them again. And refugees are not going to go back uh, unless you know they know they can go back. Uh, it'll be a decision by a family sitting around yeah. dinner, if they can afford it, and saying, uh, can I feed my kids? Can I protect them? Can I send them to schools? Will I have a job? Will I be conscripted? And if the answer to any of those questions is no, they're not going to go back. And, and since we opened our borders in October, out of 1.3 million Syrians in Jordan, only 25,000 people have gone back. Uh, so the, maybe there's less fighting within Syria, but the challenge is big. And we've got the problem with us, all of us, is quite often we think short term. Um, Long term, there is going to be a bigger challenge if we're not able to make sure that refugees feel that they are part of our human community, that we still care about them, that we do not abandon them. Uh, we need, after the war, again, uh, uh, Daesh, it, you defeat it militarily. But unless you stabilize, unless you improve living conditions, they're going to come back. And the last thing you want is for despair to penetrate into refugee communities, whether in Jordan or in Europe and elsewhere. And if despair, along with bitterness, along with ignorance, which, are, which is the best ally of, of radicalism, is allowed to dig roots, then we're going to be dealing with a huger challenge in the future. And we've seen that in Iraq. We defeated Al-Qaeda in Iraq, if you recall. But because there was failure to move on with inclusiveness, with improving the quality of life, ISIS was able to prey on that feeling of frustration and, and, and to move forward. So yeah, uh, donor, uh, you know, host countries are under tremendous amount of pressure. And I got to say it, um, I know we're on the record, but it's a reality. Uh, Jordanians have always felt a sense of pride in taking care of guests and refugees to come. That's part of the culture. It's, it's historic. Uh, so we reacted to major uh, uh, refugee crisis. Again, we're the largest per capita, or the second largest per capita host of, of refugees. Now we're starting to feel some resentment among people because, again, with unemployment at 90%, uh, a Jordanian would look at a refugee who's being subsidized or provided and says, what about me? So uh, I keep saying uh, we are dealing with exceptional circumstances. The world should employ exceptional tools in addressing that crisis by not abandoning Jordan or Turkey or Lebanon or Iraq or any of the host countries uh, to dealing with the challenge alone. because. We can only do so much, and uh, uh, there is going to come a point where uh, I think all of us are going to have to assess and say, are we all shouldering this responsibility or not? We're grateful for a lot of the support that we got, and a lot of it came in, but the challenge keeps growing. The second generation uh, uh, Syrian refugee is now a second grader at school. Those who were 12 are now 18, so they're either looking at university or the job market. So these are challenges that I think need to be looked at within uh, uh, a perspective that realizes the global implications of failure to support refugees and also support host countries that are doing everything they can to provide a decent life for refugees. Thank you. Uh, yep, I think you wanted to intervene. Well, yeah, first of all, um, to uh, Yaman, I mean, it's, it, it's a tremendous challenge that you are facing, uh, Jordan. And, and uh, I think we have a huge responsibility, the rest of us, to support as much as we can to help uh, dealing with, with the big number of, of refugees. I want to say that, of course, you, and Kevin is right. I mean, what, the, the thing that led to the uh, migration and refugee crisis in 2015 was uh, uh, under finance of uh, UNHCR and other institutions that were, should provide basic needs for uh, refugees. And therefore, I want to point out that you know, we need also to invest in the, uh, in the multilateral system. And small countries have a responsibility. We, we, Denmark, are one of the, I think, five countries in the world that actually live up to the promise of 0.7% in uh, uh, overseas development assistance that also go to uh, UNHCR and other agencies. And it's a precondition to, to prevent some of these tragic crises uh, to occur. And therefore, I, I, I think um, 
what I'm, what I think we also need to be better at is to show the value of um, of a well financed and well functioning uh, multilateral system and how it prevents human suffering and how we attack some of the root causes to many of the crises we're dealing with and after uh, very often in ways that are much more expensive and and uh, much more problematic uh, so so that's that's very important I mean if I think of how much we have discussed recently military expenditures and uh, burden sharing issues which is also important but I think we still have a huge issue when fundamentally UNHCR didn't get the money that they actually are uh, asking for. I mean, there, there's, I don't understand why we are, why the world is so reluctant in this. So thirdly, I just want to mention, finally, I mean, again, I think we also, if we want to win this fight over how important multilateralism is, as, as uh, you say, is uh, also to say, of course, it also brings a lot of good things. I mean, lifted people out of poverty. We have seen that since the establishment of international institutions. Extraordinary global cooperation. We have Paris Accord, we have SDGs, we have other things we achieved. Uh, we have, um, we, we, we see that, uh, you know, we have a UN system which, uh, when you're in New York, you feel it's all about uh, resolutions and stuff. No, it's out there in the field, making a real difference. The peace work, for example. So I think we as smaller states should highlight that more because I think when you look at the, the, pop, the global debate, it's very often between great powers and, and with, with a lot of focus on, for example, to be quite frank, which is a serious threat, what is happening in the Gulf right now, uh, Iran issue, and so it's a serious threat, but, but still, we also need to discuss the other things. How can the international and multilateral system um, ad address the root causes uh, that could prevent these kind of tensions to, to increase? So, so I think these three things is very important. <coughs> In 2013, uh, I was a Minister of Defence and we had a, um, it was this uh, gas attack uh, made by Assad regime in Syrian territory. I remember it was uh, NATO Ministers of Defence where uh, we had a dinner, we were quite divided. Should there be any kind of military uh, NATO level response uh, to Assad regime? and. Some countries, representatives of some countries, stated that uh, we should avoid that because uh, any kind of uh, um, development of uh, military involvement in the crisis could turn to the large-scale migrational crisis in European soil. I remember that. It was actually basically two years before uh, the, uh, the, the grand waves of uh, refugees started over, uh, to fall uh, to the European soil. So I think um, we should be indeed um, uh, to pay a tribute uh, to the people of uh, Jordania, to the government of Jordania. Surely I, I, I fully understand a complex of problems which arise from that and people also asking, starting to ask questions and so on. Uh, and uh, not taking it to, it, that into the parallel, because the context is, is uh, fully different, but the outcome is, is have some similarity, is we, uh, we got uh, in Estonia during the Cold War uh, as a process of russification um, uh, in our territory, we got about one third of our population uh, during, uh, uh, during almost two decades. And uh, we have uh, the, 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 we faced a lot of problems in, in integrating uh, the people, and uh, it was uh, I, I think uh, looking to the amounts of people, one third of your population in a country to integrate. Uh, um, but uh, I think we have managed uh, with that. But speaking about the uh, refugee crisis coming from Syria, and we know that the Idlib conflict produces more refugees. Uh, we, we see this humanitarian conflict right now uh, in the Ibl uh, region. I think it's uh, most important to, to look now for the indeed political solution. Uh, uh, there is a momentum, uh, a recent uh, gathering of constitutional uh, committee. And uh, I think the one element, uh, if we are going to move step by step, but we already now have to start to prepare is indeed a uh, effective return policy and a uh, 
sustainable policy and uh, responsibility of uh, countries, to, other countries to support uh, of uh, indeed uh, these people ability to, to return and to uh, start to uh, create their life because already now if we're looking at the figures uh, there are hundreds of thousands of people who have uh, returned from Turkey to, to Syria back. So I think uh, if the, uh, the element is that we, ha we need indeed uh, in the first moment to cure a, a source of the problem, and, uh, but, it's, but at the same time we have already to have to work out the, the grand plan of uh, how we can support the people of return. The, um Quick intervention here, and then I'm going to start moving towards the floor. But over to you, Minister. Just on, on the issue of, of, uh, of uh, the political solution for Syria, we all know there is only a political solution. The, the formation of the Constitutional Committee is a very good first step towards what should be a, a political process that should stop this war to, to, to an end. Uh, but the reality in Syria, and back to our initial conversation on refugee and stabilization, you know, there there is talk of reconstruction and stabilization. And reconstruction, the decision by our uh, partners in the West is it has to be linked to a credible political process. That said, we've got to differentiate between reconstruction and stabilization because to your point, if you build a school, I mean, regardless who controls the territory, if there's a thousand kids, if they grow up without a school and without a hospital and without, without, without feeling safe, what kind of generation we're bringing? If you build the school, what is the challenges that we're mitigating? So I think stabilization is something that we should look at. We have an experience in the south of Syria, which is right on our border. Uh, we see because of failure to continue humanitarian supplies, because you know the, the, the area is, is back under government control now, and therefore humanitarian supplies that used to come from Jordan are no longer going there. Uh, living conditions are deteriorating, and we can see a return of uh, ISIS penetrating through the despair of people again. So th there's, there's general theories, but there is reality on the ground. And the reality on the ground is stabilizing, depoliticizing humanitarian support is key to, again, ensuring a future that is not going to be plagued with the same ills that created the conditions that we have now. So reconstruction versus stabilization is something that I think we need to put on the table. Thank you for that intervention, a very practical one from the ground. Before I move uh, to Savita from the Global Centre for the Responsibility to Protect, just to draw a few threads together from where we've got so far in the conversation on small states, medium states, multilateralism, but with a particular, shall we say, practical case study, which is the success or failure of our current multilateral system to deal with this massive outflow from a single country. Um, and so I think this is a critical conversation for the future. I mean, it brings together, do, are we serious about the Sustainable Development Goals? Because that, if properly executed, minimizes the push factors from around the world, if we're serious about it. That's what the um, Agenda 2030 is all about. But secondly, if that doesn't work, and we do have a military crisis somewhere, and a security crisis, and people get pushed out to neighboring states, uh, our UNHCR mechanisms under the uh, Convention and the other international instruments, in, in my argument, should have an automatic contingency fund which flips into gear at the point at which you have such a crisis, as opposed to what we have now, which is an emergency global appeal. Uh, and frankly, it's usually undersubscribed. So that when there is an outflow like that, automatically the agency is funded. And thirdly, if for whatever reason people continue to move further afield, uh, then you have the UNHCR managing and funded to manage uh, processing centres for people so that criteria are applied to determine refugee status longer term. And in a wild utopian dream, but frankly, if we don't do it, we're all going to crack, and that is how about an equitable distribution worldwide uh, according to global per capita income, uh, in terms of sharing the burden for those 65 million people who are currently either internally or ex internationally displaced persons, uh, some uh, 15 to 20 million of whom have been languishing uh, literally uh, for decades. Because if you don't, then the wash-through effect on the politics of countries around the world uh, does what? 
It re-radicalizes, or sorry, it radicalizes the politics in those countries, makes them more xenophobic and much less likely to contribute to the institutions we need to be properly funded in the first place to prevent outflow. So there's a, a couple of um, radical ideas. Um, now, I'd really like to hear from Savita, a Global Centre for the Responsibility to Protect, and then we're going to move to a general Q&A. Savita, why don't you go to the microphone? Probably easier for you. Push the button. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, very, very important discussion and, and really uh, fantastic presentations from all three of you. And also, Mr. Rudd, it's always great to hear your very radical ideas about you know, distribution and whatnot. Um, I want to sort of commend uh, Estonia especially for your you know, really important strides into the next frontier of security, cybersecurity, and Jordan and, and other small states like Bangladesh who are bearing the brunt of the refugee crisis, which is ongoing. And, and seriously providing refuge to populations uh, fleeing from you know, the worst crimes which have been committed against them, from genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity and ethnic cleansing. And I would also like to come in Denmark because you have been a, a huge norm champion for the responsibility to protect mm. the organization um, that I work for and the norm that I work um, in making a reality. You have invested heavily in the institutional, creating the institutional networks that are necessary for putting in place atrocity prevention as a as a real concrete um, outcome. Um, I mean, Australia, all of these countries have been really useful uh, as norm champions. Uh, so there's a huge amount of space for small and medium states in uh, preserving the multilateral system and advancing all the sort of norms that can safeguard humanity from IHL, from uh, atrocity prevention, to just human rights, uh, essentially. So my question to all three of you would be that, um, as small and medium states and through a multilateral system, um, what, um, what do you think you can do in terms of countering this climate of impunity which has come into place, especially in the context of violation of human rights and commission of atrocities? And in just in that context, I mean, Gambia has recently announced its intention to pursue a case against Myanmar for the commission of genocide in the International Court of Justice. And, and that sort of gives you hope because it's a very small state which is coming out of a, um, a really problematic history and going through a transition and has many internal challenges like you, Minister, you talked about in Jordan and the same for Bangladesh. So would just like to hear some thoughts around countering this climate of impunity that exists. Thank okay, you thank you very much, much Sarita. I might start with Yep and I might move uh, up the panel. If I could ask our ministers to perhaps limit their remarks to a couple of about two minutes. That way we can get to Q&A from the audience with about 25 minutes to go. Sure, thank you. Thank, thank you for your um, comments and, and question. First of all, I think it's, it's important to see, you know, small countries have used the UN to drive some of the most important changes. You alluded to it. Uh, translation of human rights declaration into human rights conventions was driven also by small and medium-sized states. Establishment of the International Criminal Court, you alluded to, uh, was also because of this push. Uh, ban on anti-personal minds, for example, uh, UN peacebuilding peace architecture, universal periodic review. All of these things are done because of small and medium-sized states. Uh, not the big powers, because they think they can deal with it in another ma in another way. So, so uh, therefore, um, I would say we have to continue that, and also understand that we have been instrumental to create some of the institutions that, that for example, ICC that you alluded to, um, and what Denmark is doing right now, for example, in Syria, is to collect evidence of the atrocities that are taking place there. Because you're right, one day, hopefully. Uh, justice has to be, be theirs and the people who did the, the atrocities has to, to face trial and we need to follow up. So, so I think that's a role for, for small states at least. That's what I want uh, Denmark to, to support and do. Thank you. I'm in. Thank you. I, I guess we just have to keep the conversation alive. We've got to keep trying. We cannot give up. I mean, again, there's a limit to how much we can do as smaller countries. We put forward ideas, we push, but ultimately it's the bigger powers that be that really dictate how, how things go. Um, uh, uh, a lot of the hotspots, unfortunately, become battleground for global wars. Uh, and we've seen that almost in every civil war and every crisis that we've seen. 
they start within a local domestic context and then everybody starts interfering and before we know it, it becomes a, a battleground for all takes area. Um, I mean, quite often I, I have to to say when we're speaking about Syria is that we got to bring back the focus that it is about Syria and the Syrian people. And the question should be, are we doing what's right for the Syria and the Syrian people? Or are we just mitigating or, or playing the power game among, among powers that are? So uh, uh, that's a challenge that we have uh, to focus on. We need to invest to the extent that we can in examples of functioning multilateralism. And I'll give you another example uh, on Roa. Uh, UNRWA is doing a tremendous job for 5 million Palestinian refugees opening schools, running health clinics. Last year, because of politics, uh, again, uh, we started with a deficit of $446 million, which would have meant schools would close. Uh, because we all came together within a multilateral context, we were able to bring down that deficit to about $20 million and schools opened. This year, UNRWA's deficit is $120 million. Uh, we provide those $120 million, multilateralism will work and you'll send a message to the Palestinian refugee that the world still cares. Because what else are you going to tell him? What are you, you going to tell a Palestinian kid growing under occupation, his GDP average per capita is 4,000 compared to almost 40 by his occupier. Uh, he cannot get water, but you know his occupier is getting all the water that they need. What do you tell him about multilateral system? When you know you annex his land, hijack his future or her future. So UNRWA will be a good message that is easily doable uh, to, to address that concern. And look, the difference between providing $120 million or not, or keeping UNRWA going or not, is 260,000 kids in Gaza alone, which is already the biggest open prison in the world because of the, 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 the seizure and the blockade and all. The alternative to that is send them to the street and then speak of security and speak of all of us coming together. So these are actually those. Tomorrow, again, in partnership with another medium-sized small countries, with Sweden, we've been in partnership for years. We're putting together a conference to bring to highlight the need to maintain UNRWA. So let's look for multilateral functions that work. Peacekeeping troops, a small country like Jordan, contributed 75,000 peacekeepers over the years. So there are things that we can do, but ultimately, the best we can do is, again, initiatives like the youth initiative we launched, other initiatives with, with small like-minded countries uh, to push forward. But ultimately, uh, uh, it is unfortunately, reality is that sometimes the conversation goes over our heads uh, and, and we just have to deal with the consequences and pay the price. And uh, briefly, Omar, so I'm going to turn to Q&A from the audience. Yeah. I think first issue is actually uh, how is it could it be so that crimes uh, against humanity and genocidal crimes uh, to address these uh, they could be used veto in security council so it means crimes against humanity are an issue of arbitrary diplomatic debate this is unmoral concept to be honest uh, the veto should be abolished in that case the second issue is indeed uh, uh, the scope of International Criminal Court, as Jeppe mentioned. Uh, it is too narrow still, we have to admit. And uh, the third one, as uh, Sir Kevin put an idea of uh, global compulsory refugee quotas. I wouldn't be very uh, friend of that concept, but, but still I will put also an idea to the air of uh, there are still narrow group of countries but uh, who are using in their criminal um, uh, investigation and who could raise charges uh, under the universal concept of criminal responsibility of crimes against humanity. It means in the, uh, the, the, these countries, the several countries in the world, take the responsibility, a universal responsibility, to, to, to take uh, uh, into responsibility these criminals. So I think this is, could be in the future look, that maybe it is a country's universal responsibility in future. It not depending in which country's soil you commit a genocidal crime, you could be uh, should in any country all over the world. Uh, so because the crime of, uh, against humanity, it is not an international relations issue, it is a personal criminal act, and there are always personalities responsible of that. It's interesting, uh, you mentioned the International Criminal Court the, um, and the Rome Statute. 
and the role of small states. Those of us who are familiar with the evolution of the Rome Statute would know that one of the principal actors in bringing the international diplomacy together for it was um, that uh, global superpower, Liechtenstein. Um, so uh, it's pretty interesting uh, what you can do with a good idea and a multilateral institution and a bit of diplomacy. You can actually make things happen. Now, there's a question here first. Yeah. Now, come up here and ask the question. That's OK. You're OK. The only reason we're doing this and not having handheld is because all the security around the buildings with the UN. It's not allowed general, anymore. Okay. No, 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 no. It just interferes and we get uh, all interferes. sorts of static. So my name is Shazia Rafi. I'm former Secretary General of Parliamentarians for Global Action, now uh, running Global Parliamentary Services. Um, just a quick comment first on the ICC. The country that actually started it with a resolution at the UN was Trinidad Tobago, hmm. another uh, great superpower. Yeah. Um, I actually wanted to talk about and ask the opinion, since all of you are politicians, there is a parallel system of multilateral diplomacy, which are the work of parliamentary organizations. There are by now 88 of them. Uh, you know, in addition to the IPU. Some are official, some are unofficial. And many of them have been involved in both preventive diplomacy, the responsibility to prevent, which is almost more important than the responsibility to protect, um, including sending actual missions of pol politicians um, to talk to uh, countries in transition before uh, the crisis breaks out over the borders. And I'd be interested to know in particular uh, from Your Excellency regarding Jordan as to whether there are efforts at this point by parliamentarians or politicians from the Arab League to try to see how this other tail end of the conflict in Syria it can be settled down so that people can return home. Thank you. So why don't we start uh, with uh, Jordan, and then I'll take the others. Look, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, there's a tremendous role uh, uh, to play by parliamentarians. Uh, our parliament has been very active in that. Actually, Jordan now is in the chair of the Arab Parliamentary Union, uh, and uh, they uh, uh, do whatever they can to try and contribute to the conversation, keep the issues alive, and move forward. So. The short answer is yes, uh, we do uh, recognize the importance, we do support that role, and our parliament is very active within regional parliamentary uh, mechanisms or even global uh, to try and uh, contribute to the debate and, and, and put uh, for ideas forward. Uh, my, answer, my answer is also, of course also positive. I think this is a, this is a power of uh, we could more use more uh, as an element of diplomacy in conflict resolution and uh, avoidance of prevention. And yep. Well, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for an excellent question. Um, I, I mean, also you have to remember that the ICC and the Rome Statute it has to be ratified by parliaments. And therefore, I think it's very important just to, in that you know to ensure that there's a debate in national parliaments around the world how important these rules are and also that they are part of a process you know, uh, to discuss the, the problems, the solutions, and also be able to ratify the Rome Statutes, for example. Uh, be because, uh, as, frankly speaking, um, I mean, coming from Denmark, I also see sometimes that, you know, I wish there was more connection between, you know, the realities we face as, as Danish uh, parliamentarians or politi political national political scene and, and what goes on in the world. So I think the role of interparliamentarian organizations uh, is fundamental, and I think we should, we should value their work more, I think, um, uh, and, um, and I would at least uh, do what I can do. I mean, I've been a member of European Parliament and National Parliament, and I see uh, it makes a difference uh, that sometimes it's parliamentarians and parliamentarians talking together, Rather, and, and it's not to offend all the diplomats in the room, but I think it's uh, it's important because many parliamentarians also are faced the, with the uh, you know with the requirements of the citizens, the expectations. They are elected officials, and and they therefore they understand some of the concerns that are there. So, so I, I, I agree full support for uh, interparliamentarian -parl organizations. Just to um, if I take this one, just to add to that point, there is a role also I think for. Former parliamentarians, former presidents, prime ministers, etc. I'm aware of two institutions which do this, and I'm sure you are as well. 
I'm a member of something called the Global Leadership Foundation based in London. They work with countries around the world, quietly below the radar in, frankly, dispute prevention um, and conflict prevention and certainly conflict management when it emerges. And there's another one in the Asia-Pacific region which um, is active in this field as well. And I see a question here. Please, right to the front. Andrea Bartoli, Comedio Sant'Eginia. And uh, I would like to respond to, to take the, the, the clue from Irma's uh, observation before about the responsibility of a criminal act and the fact that there is a personal responsibility and turn it around for a moment on the more positive responsibility of learning or thinking differently. You know, I'm very fascinated by the invitations and if we think that uh, there was no peacekeeping operation before a person invented you know something i wonder if you could elaborate with us the way you learn that is to say there is a personal responsibility of learning we are all facing this very serious challenge of unknown and uh, very significant uncertainty so I'm curious how you see this uh, challenge of learning personally and institutionally. I mean, one of the reasons I came is because Denmark invested into this global action against mass atrocity crimes. Wonderful new things, inventing this space, state-led initiative, civil society participates, something that doesn't exist. Three years ago, come together with Switzerland, Tanzania, Costa Rica, Australia at that time, then they, Australia left. And, uh, but it's interesting how the, the international system is evolving. And we are going to see more and more of this because many of the political decisions that need to be made are actually connected to knowledge, connected to learning. So I'm curious if you could elaborate on that because I feel that IPI is giving a floor for us to learn. Uh, I'll Anyone from the panel wish to um, engage in that open question? Uh, we've, the answer is we've learned nothing, so that's fine. Yeah. Surely we have to learn. About, it is a very clever message. But I think uh, we have to also to put it to the moral perspective. Indeed. And uh, it is not solely also an academic exercise of prevention uh, to the future generations and in these communities where the crimes were committed uh, uh, to avoid and to, to reconciliation, to build a reconciliation. So one-fifth of my country's population was annihilated uh, under the Nazi and communist regime. One-fifth. And so sure, and there are uh, many people who are not taken into responsibility. So this is not, for example, for personally to me, were academic exercise. Uh, if I if I look to the map and so, and and I think this is a, a historical perspective of two, three, four generations. But I can feel the pain of the societies where these uh, crimes have taken place, and I think the, at le the least what the uh, um, uh, we we uh, are should uh, give to the victims who are not anymore with us is indeed uh, uh, that the, these people need to be uh, resp taken into the responsibility. They need to hold the, about for the crimes. Th it is not an issue of lack of knowledge of these uh, issue people, but the, the, uh, their vice being. Okay. Any other contributions from the panel? The... Um one little reflection on that is, um, you know this wonderful system of ours called the UN multilateral system, um, with these multiple institutions which, are, which have grown up within its framework over the last 75 years. Um, and let's just take peacekeeping. Um, let's take uh, UN field operations with refugees, etc. One of our deficiencies across the road is this, our ability systematically to do lessons learned exercises. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we here at the IPI, I chaired this exercise on Independent Commission on Multilateralism, which is um, reviewing the future of the multilateral system for the future. One of the recommendations was this. Uh, there are no resources across the road for a fully fledged policy planning capability. That is a research capability within the UN, which is not just looking out three, five, seven years, 
against emerging trends which can create tomorrow's security problems, but actually institutionally also learning uh, from what we've done so far. So rolling synthesis of field missions completed, rolling synthesis of peace and security missions succe successes and failures and why. And I think it won't happen unless we have a dedicated capacity to learn creatively in an ongoing fashion, as your clever question suggested. Uh, do I have any other questions from the floor here? There's a gentleman here and then one here. Yeah, Please come up to the front. Hmm. Um, Wasim Mir from the United Nations Foundation. So thank you very much for the excellent presentations and very thought-provoking uh, discussion. We had a lot of discussion about the, the UN needs to demonstrate more success. Uh, and that's an easy message to, t uh, to take. But at one level, the UN is doing more, more successfully than perhaps it's ever done before. It's looking, you know, it's providing food aid to what of 80 million people across the world. It's looking after 65 million refugees. It's providing vaccines to 45% of children, saving 3 million lives a year. Yet those messages don't seem to be able to resonate with the public. And you've got three or four politicians up there who have to talk directly to voters. What would it take to make those successes, and you know, leaving aside the failures, because there are lots of failures, and there have been failures since the day the UN was created. What would it take to make some of those successes resonate more with the voters that you have to turn to? A $100 million grant from the UN Foundation to, in, to, <laughs> uh, to enhance the global promotion through all social media and contemporary media platforms of everyday successes. But apart from that, over to you. <laughs> no, well, well thank, you. thank you so much for the, uh, for the questions. Um, well, fir firstly, I think, actually maybe linked to the previous question as well, if we can um, help to, uh, to, to increase the understanding of how valuable some of the UN program has been. You, you were talking about peacekeeping, for example. There, as I am familiar with, I'm familiar with, with studies that clearly shows the huge impact of peacekeeping operations around the world to preventing and also overcoming conflicts. Because sometimes when you're in the middle of a, of, of a conflict situation, you feel the fatigue, I think, with the word you used, over the situation, but if you look in the in the long term, backwards, uh, then you can see that it actually had a big effect with a relatively small amount of of, uh, of investment. I mean, I think Denmark since uh, Second World War we contributed with fifty thousand uh, blue helmets uh, to different things, and uh, Jordan even more. I heard. So 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 also small and medium sized countries can can support this. Uh, so I think that's one thing to tell the story that it actually works. Compare. How, how little the cost of peacekeeping to what other costs we use on military spending in the world is also a stark reminder of, of our priorities, I think. So how can the UN be more effective? I mean, well, I, you, you know, coming from the climate summit, uh, I was happy that the Secretary General put this on the table. And, it, and not only new declaration, but actually focusing on action deliverables. Uh, and I think I have to say I was very happy of the outcome from the climate summit, that there were, you know, um, new deliverables. For example, when uh, taking a country like Denmark, we are forming an alliance with the maritime industry in the world to mm. to say we're getting to zero on maritime, not only the, the ships, but also all infrastructure, ports, yeah. an industry, a sector that hasn't been covered by the Paris Accord in 2015. But now we can do it. We can, together with the industry and investors, we can show the way. We will have two, 2030 the first... Uh, uh, carbon-free ships uh, out there. Um, so, so I think focusing on that UN can be a facilitator of real action uh, on, on some of these issues are important. And then I would again say what the UN is doing out in the field is, you know, but maybe that is just your task to, to show the world, you know, how important it is, uh, the work. And we can also, as I said before, in national parliaments uh, help as for ministers to highlight it when we talk to our public, to our uh, constituents, to our parliaments, how important the UN is. Thank you. I think uh, there is the work on the ground that the UN does through a multiplicity of UN organizations, but the, the brand name for those organizations is very strong, UNICEF, UNESCO, World Health Organization, World Food Program. I think everybody recognizes how valuable uh, uh, their work is. But again, a very strong brand, individual names that somehow people kind of 
forget that they are really a product of the UN system and, and acting for it. And unfortunately, what people judge the UN by uh, at times of crisis, particularly and in areas where people are suffering from the consequences, consequences of crises, is the political face of the UN. And that is the Security Council. Uh, resolutions are adopted only to be broken uh, or adopted only to be selectively applied uh, depending on the interest of, again, the major powers that kind of uh, get them implemented or block them from being implemented. And people see that face. So the UN is pretty much looked at uh, in terms of image from its political perspective. But if you ask people, how great is you know UNICEF is acting or WFP or others? They'll say, yeah, great work, but but again, different brand names and and and, and that's a challenge. So I think none of us here meant to in any way belittle the role of the UN. On the contrary, we're here to support it and we're here to say we we want to strengthen it and empower it. But we're I think just describing a reality that uh, that it is our job and our duty to be truthful about it and and say it as it is. Well, I think uh, the issues of uh, legitimacy and and, and uh, uh, they are not unique of uh, of looking to the United Nations. We could speak about the nation states about that. Uh, every government faces <laughs> in a guarantee the same problems. But I think if we think that does uh, United Nations need uh, not a cheap but just a popularity amongst just uh, ordinary communities? So. I think this is not a precondition of the well, good functioning of United Nations uh, as organization. Uh, uh, it, it precondition is that uh, the countries uh, believe that this is a useful tool and they take it seriously and uh, and there is a well, it will produce uh, outcome. So I think the audience, in a way, of that uh, trust um, uh, is indeed uh, uh, the governments of the countries. And uh, I think uh, looking to the vast catalogue, if we would pass in, in a referendum globally about uh, is the United Nations uh, positive or not, I think it will be overwhelmingly popular uh, yes vote. Uh, not very good agenda. No doubts about that. Speaking of a yes vote, I think there is a yes vote in favour of drawing the session to a close because I see very anxious ministerial staffers at the back wondering if they can get their ministers to the next uh, appointment. Uh, thank you all for your attendance. Uh, go to your website for IPI, look at the review of the multilateral system, uh, and let's look at how we can, as small and medium states, rekindle commitment to the multilateral order for the future. I thank you for your attendance.